Good morning and welcome to Sunrise United Methodist. Would you please stand as you are able and join us in our opening praises. Take a moment. 
moment to greet one another, and those of you worshiping at home, send a text or an email to a loved one. Say good morning. announcements. Um, VBS, we have the date slated June 5th through the 9th, so mark your calendars. We will need kids and volunteers. Imagine that. Um, we also have the extravaganza coming up, which I think uh, Pastor Tiffany will talk about a little bit more. Um, but what we're going to do this morning is, guys, you see Pastor Matt up here? It's because he knows that I need his help this morning. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to hand him this bottle of water, because we're going to talk about water today. And every single time I say the word water, we're going to practice water, he has to take a drink. So I love water. It was water, it wasn't spit. Yeah, there we go. So I love water. <laughs> okay, so here we go. Did you guys know that 71% of the earth is covered in water? Most of the water is in the ocean. 71, oh wait, the adult human body is 60% water, and a baby is 78% water. And those are just a few facts about water. In the Bible, Jesus said he could give us living water. Okay, I need you guys to raise your hand if you've ever played a sport, or if you play any sports, raise your hand. On the count of three, I want you to say it. And when I do this, you have to get really quiet, okay? So I'm going to go one, two, three. You guys say it, and then I'll do my fun little thing. Ready? One, two, three. Ooh. Double. Guys, we have some sporty kids up here, don't we? Well, when you play sports, what do you usually need to do? Stay hydrated, right? And what do you usually stay hydrated with? Um, sometimes you can drink sports drinks, sometimes there's energy drinks out there on the shelves, um, but, you know, there's flavored water, too. Uh, there's also some sports drinks out there, they sit there and they're like, oh, if you drink this, we'll quench your thirst, it's better than water, it's better than water, <laughs> juice, or any other thing. But... Do you know what they don't say when you're watching these commercials and they've got their basketball players and they're drinking their Powerades and their Gatorades? They don't say, 
this will quench your thirst and you'll never be thirsty again, do they? No. Wouldn't it be pretty cool if somebody did that? Did you guys know that someone has said they have done that very thing? And his name is Jesus. So I'm going to tell you guys a little story. All right, here we go. One day, Jesus was walking through a town in Samaria. Bless you. He was hot and tired, so he sat down beside a well to rest. A woman came to the well to get some water, and Jesus asked her if she would give him a drink. The woman was surprised that Jesus spoke to her because Jews would not usually speak to Samaritans. Jesus told her that he could give her living water. She didn't understand what he was talking about, so she said, you don't even have anything to get water in. How can, you, how can you give me living water? Then Jesus said, whoever, whoever drinks from the water from this well will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst again. I'm getting a little nervous. Matt's getting, he's getting closer over here. <laughs> okay, so that's pretty cool, guys. Water that would satisfy your thirst so that you will never be thirsty again. Jesus wasn't talking about our thirst for water, though. He was talking about our thirst for God. The Bible teaches us that we have a thirst in our heart for the living God. And that is a thirst that only Jesus can satisfy. So, when we have Jesus in our heart, he satisfies our thirst for God. And we will never thirst again. Okay, so I don't know about you guys, but I'm thirsty for that kind of water Jesus gives. Jesus is life, guys. Drink it up. Let's pray. Dear Lord, you have given us Jesus, the living water. We may drink of your living water so we will never thirst again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Run to Sunday school. <laughs> <laughs> The last service, I was sitting behind Matt, so we, we moved over. <laughs> Fun stuff. We would like to welcome you to worship at Sunrise United Methodist Church. We are so glad that you are here this morning, and we believe that you will get a glimpse of God's love and grace while you are here. Um, if you would take a moment to fill out the friendship folder that's at the end of the pew, fill it out, pass it down, take a moment to look, or look, see who is around you this morning. Maybe more importantly, look around and see who forgot to change their clocks before they went to bed and remind them to do that sometime before they're late for work tomorrow. Um, if you desire to join the church, the time to join is when we, the last verse of the final song Fill out a membership card that is in the pew rack in front of you. Bring it forward, and I will welcome you into membership here at Sunrise. There's a lot going on through the season of Lent, a lot of classes and gatherings, but I want to take this moment to lift up Holy Week so you have time to invite um, friends and neighbors to come join with us that week. So there is Palm Sunday concert. So on that Palm Sunday, we, we will have that worship concert rather than a regular service at 9 and 10.30. Wednesday that week is a Seder meal. You do need to RSVP for that. So the last day to RSVP is April 2nd. The Living Last Supper is at 7, Good Friday service at 7. Uh, Sunrise players are coming in, and they're doing a living tableau for us at the end of the service. And if you don't know what that is, you just need to come experience it, because it's going to be really cool that day. Saturday is the extravaganza, and Lacey is asking for your help to get ready for that. So there is a bucket of empty Easter eggs out there in the atrium, and there are a bunch of bag sitting there next to it and she is asking take it home fill the eggs with candy put them all back in the bag and bring them back here we have a lot of people that show up for the extravaganza we would love for all those kiddos to have eggs full of candy so please please consider bringing those home and filling them up and then finally of course Easter service we will do sunrise Easter at 7 and then the Easter service is at 9 and 10:30 our regular worship times there's a lot that week so consider who might you invite 
to come and worship with us and, and experience this journey to the cross. I invite you to look online for more information about all of these upcoming events and our current classes and gatherings. As we move into our time of offering, I would like to acknowledge the ways in which God uses your gifts to bless others. And as I thought about this this week, I, I've experienced classes, our Wednesday night class, and the deeply moving conversations we've had there. And Thursday evening, we were doing mindfulness in the wilderness, just this opportunity to lean deeply into the season of Lent, to reflect on our lives and our relationship with God. It is because of your faithful giving that we can do these together. Sunrise, you truly are a faithful community. As we return to worship, I would like to invite the ushers forward to collect the offering.
you are a generous God. You pour so much into our lives. So in this moment, we give back. Take these gifts, bless them, use them, that all might know your love. Amen. You may be seated. Hear these words from the book of Psalms. Oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. In his hands are the depths of the earth. The heights of the mountains are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and the dry land which his hands have formed. O oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, and the sheep of his hand. O oh, that today you would listen to his voice. Do not harden your hearts as at Meribah, as on the day at Massah in the wilderness, when your ancestors tested me and put me to the proof. Though they had seen my work for forty years, they loathed that generation, and said, They are people whose hearts go astray. Therefore, in my anger, I swore, they shall not enter my rest. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I got a job for you when you get a little older. <laughs> or maybe now, actually. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, Tanner's right. It is a time to sing for joy to the Lord, as written in today's scripture reading. The worst of winter is over. The signs of spring have returned. Easter is less than a month away. And today is the last official day of selling Girl Scout cookies. Amen to that. Despite encountering so many every day, it is easy to overlook our blessings. We are so distracted by the things around us that we perceive as wrong that we can't appreciate how much is right about our city, our nation, about our kids, and most other kids, about ourselves, and certainly about our church. Being here this morning, sharing this space together, that alone is a reason to be hopeful about today and about the future. Father, we ask that you not only lift up those without hope, but allow us the opportunity to be good shepherds to those who are lost, to provide comfort to those who are suffering, and to spread the joy that comes with being a follower of Jesus. We also ask that you watch over our men and women in uniform, our first responders, those who will travel over spring break in the coming weeks. Guide us in our decisions as we choose new leadership for our city and guide them in their service to us. Let there be peace, prosperity, and unity. Most of all, let there be love for you, for ourselves, and for each other. And now let us pray together the prayer your son Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. these words from the book of Exodus. From the wilderness of sin, the whole congregation of the Israelites journeyed by stages as the Lord commanded. They camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. The people quarreled with Moses and said, give us water to drink. Moses said to them, why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted there for water. And the people complained against Moses and said, Why did you bring us out of Egypt to kill us and our children and livestock with thirst? So Moses cried out to the Lord, What shall I do with this people? They are almost ready to stone me. The Lord said to Moses, Go on ahead of the people and take some of the elders of Israel with you. Take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile and go. I will be standing there in front of you on the rock at Harob. Strike the rock and water will come out of it so that the people may drink. Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. He called the place Massa and Meribah because the Israelites quarreled and tested the Lord saying, is the Lord among us or not? This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. O oh God, open us up. Open our eyes that we might see, our ears that we might hear. God, open our hearts that we might feel. And then, O oh God, open our hands that when we leave this place, we might leave here to serve you and your love. Amen. She begins the first chapter by saying, remember, you are a cheetah born wild and free. That's how I wish she ended the first chapter anyway. Instead, she she used some language that I can't use from up here, but it was funny anyway. I am talking about the first chapter, the prelude of the untamed book by Glennon Doyle. She tells the story of being at the zoo with her family. And they go to the zoo's biggest attraction, the cheetah run. And her and her family, they settle in and get ready for the show. And out comes the zookeeper walking on a leash a very cute little Labrador retriever named Minnie. And Glennon's thinking, wait, wait, I don't know much about animals, but if they're going to try to convince me that this is a cheetah, I want my money back. But instead, the zookeeper started talking and said, do you all think this is a cheetah? And they're like, no. And she's like, it's not. This is Minnie. Minnie has been the cheetah Tabitha's friend since they were both really little. 
Minnie helps teach Tabitha how to stay tame, how to be in control. She teaches her how to, to just be more a dog than a wild cheetah. So the zookeeper explains that Minnie is going to do the cheetah run first, so that way Tabitha remembers what to do. And they, the, she takes the dog at, her, at the starting line, and, and right in front of them is a jeep, and uh, tied to that jeep is a really dirty, ugly, pink stuffed bunny. And the zookeeper tells the truck to go, she lets the dog mini go, and the dog chases after that bunny, doesn't quite catch it, but gets his treat at the end anyway. And then it's Tabitha's turn. Tabitha starts at the starting line on her leash, chasing that dirty pink bunny as the Jeep goes. Of course, not catching the bunny, but you see this streak of cheetah run by, and at the end, that cheetah gets a store-bought steak as a treat. And the zookeeper takes that cheetah and puts it in a, in a field surrounded by a cage and then goes to the audience and asks if they have any questions. One little girl pops up her hand. Doesn't Tabitha miss the wild? And the zookeeper says, no, of course not. She, she was never wild. She was born in captivity. The only thing she really knows is, is how to be a dog. And she's safer here. There's food here for her. There's nobody after her. There's water here. She's safer here. And as questions continue, the zookeeper asking questions, or the people asking questions and the zookeeper answering, Glennon's daughter Tish pokes her. Mom, look at Tabitha. And Glenna, Glennon looks at that cheetah in that field, walking the fence line, looking out back and forth, looking to see what's out there, what's beyond the fence. And then Tabitha stops, stands up tall and looks out. And Glennon says, wow, she looked so regal. Tish pokes her and says, look, Tabitha's wild again. And Glennon says, I wish I could ask that cheetah what she was thinking. And here is what I think that cheetah would say. Something's off about my life. I feel restless and frustrated. I have this hunch that everything was supposed to be more beautiful than this. I imagine fenceless, wide open savannas. I want to run and hunt and kill. I want to sleep under an ink-black, silent sky filled with stars. It's all so real. I can taste it. Then she looked back at the cage, the only home she's ever known. She'd look at the smiling zookeepers, the bored spectators, and the panting, bouncing, begging best friend. She'd sigh and say, I should be grateful. I have a good enough life here. It's crazy to long for what doesn't even exist. And Glennon said, I would tell her, you're not crazy. You're a cheetah. So today's part of the story, we're, we're dropping in right into the middle of the wilderness. The Hebrew people have gained their freedom from Egypt. Egypt, 
that place where they had lived for generations, it is all they knew was Egypt. And they got free. And what they found out in the wilderness is that Egypt protected them. Egypt Egypt made sure they had something to eat and something to drink. And now here they are in the wilderness. And they don't know what to do. They don't believe in themselves. They don't really, they're not really sure about God either. How do we feed ourselves? How do we keep alive out here? They've been protected for generations. So here are these words again, this time from the message version. Directed by God, the whole company of Israel moved on by stages from the wilderness of sin. They set camp at Rephidim, and there wasn't a drop of water for the people to drink. The people took Moses to task. Give us water to drink. But Moses said, why pester me? Why are you testing God? But the people were thirsty for water there. They complained to Moses, why did you take us from Egypt and drag us out here with our children and animals to die of thirst? Moses cried out in prayer to God. What can I do with these people any minute now? They'll kill me. And God said to Moses, go out ahead of the people, taking with you some of the elders of Israel. Take the staff you used to strike the Nile and go. I'm going to be present before you there on the rock at Harab. You are to strike the rock. Water will gush out of it and the people will drink. Moses did what he said with the elders of Israel right there watching. He named the place Massa, which means the testing place, and Meribah, which means quarreling, because of the quarreling of the Israelites and because of their testing of God when they said, is God here with us? or not. They just wanted to go back to that place that was safe. We liked our cage, come to think of it. You know, we have our cages too, right? Our cages of fear, of addiction, worrying about not being enough, worrying about disconnection, about shaping ourselves in such a way that we will fit in and have a place to belong, even if that means no longer being ourselves. And we do it because the wilderness can be really scary. It can be lonely. We find ourselves out there not sure where to find water, food, connection, love. The wilderness, though, is where we find ourselves. The wilderness is where we find God. Glennon goes on later in the book to tell of of her time when her and her family were going through divorce. She was leaving her husband. She said, you know, I had spent my daughter's entire life doing everything I could to protect her. Oh, be careful of that. Be careful of that. I'll always be here for you. I'll never leave you. I am here and I will protect you no matter what. And then Glennon found herself in this divorce, laying down her daughter's worst fears at her daughter's feet, being the one to unstabilize her life to put her in grief and Glennon struggled with that and she questioned her desire as a parent to protect her child she says this 
I do not want to protect my children from life's fires. I want them to point, I want to point them towards the fire and say, I see your fear and it is big. I also see your courage and it's bigger. We can do hard things, baby. We are fireproof. If I could do it again, I'd toss out the sign I once hung on Tish's nursery wall that read, every little thing will be all right, and I'd replace it with bunkers, here is the world. Beautiful and terrible things will happen. Don't be afraid. In her blog, Leah, um, Leah Peters tells the story of the 18th anniversary of her boyfriend's death. She was 17 when he died, and she talks about the lessons that she had learned through that grief. And looking back on it, she talks about her grief on that 18th anniversary, and she's looking back at her grief, and she says this, I often describe my experience with grief after Dustin died like this. I, it was like I was drowning. I was so weighed down by my heartbreak. Then one day, I decided to just dive all the way down into it, to sink into this unbearable ocean of grief, only to discover that I had gills. For weeks, it was like I lived at the bottom of my own soul, digging my feet into soft sand at the depth of an ocean, learning about the quietest, scariest parts of myself. And when I was ready, I kicked off and I swam. I trust and believe in myself and my resilience in my capacity, in who I am at my very core, differently and more powerfully than before. It is in the wilderness that we find our strength. It is in the wilderness that we find ourselves. It is in the wilderness that we discover that we are courageous and fireproof that we can swim, even when we feel like we're drowning. It is the wilderness where we find God's love meeting us right there as we become more and more of what God created us to be. We open ourselves more and more to God's love. On Thursday nights, after 20 or so minutes of silence and being aware of our breathing, Jill Marvin, who is leading, leading us, she played a, I don't know if it's a spoken word or a sermon, I think it might be a little mix of both, but it's absolutely beautiful. So his name is Graham Cook, this poet. It's called The Inheritance. It begins this way. There is nothing you can do that would make God love you more. There is also nothing you can do that would make God love you less. God loves you because God loves you, 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 because that is what God is like. If you stay in your cages, protected and secure, if not fully yourself, God loves you. If you break free from your cages and find yourself in the wilderness, unsure of where you will find connection, God loves you. If you tentatively dip your toe out into the wilderness, not sure if you're ready to go or not, God loves you. Graham goes on to say this. The Lord says, 
You can only love me as much as you love yourself. So my love comes this evening to set you free from yourself, to set you free from how you see yourself, to set you free from the smallness of your own thinking about yourself. My love comes to set you free from rejection and from shame and from low self-esteem and from despair and from abuse. Because when I look at you, says the Lord, I see something that I love. I see someone that I can love outrageously. And I have so much to bestow upon you, so much to give you, so many places to take you in my heart. But you can't go there unless you allow me to love you. And my love for you will break every barrier bring every wall crashing down. I know this, says the Lord. My love damages fear. My love hates fear. My love will fight fear. It will fight fear in you. It will fight fear around you. And if you have found fear this evening, says the Lord, then know that you have a treat in store. Because my perfect love casts out fear. There is no fear where I am. Thanks be to God. Jesus sitting around the table with his disciples, giving all of himself to this world, says, you are not crazy. There is something more beautiful, more true out there. You're not crazy. You are loved. And to remember this love to find nourishment in the wilderness. He gave us this meal. He said, he broke the bread. He blessed it. said, take of this often and remember me. Remember no matter what wilderness you find yourself in there, I am to nourish you. And when the meal was over, he took the cup. He blessed the cup. He said, drink from this often that you might remember that you are loved. Let us pray. Oh, holy God, pour down on these gifts of bread and juice. Pour your spirit on them. Make them be for us, your body and your blood, that we might know the depth of your presence with us even in the wilderness. Amen. Here in a moment, the ushers will invite you forward. You will come down the aisles, receive a communion, and you may, you will receive a piece of bread that you will dip into the cup to receive. If you are not ready for that or you are gluten-free, there are um, little containers, the little cups up here that you may grab one of those on your way by instead. The rail is available for you to come kneel and pray for as long as you would like before returning to your pew by the open aisles. If you desire prayers for healing and wholeness, you may go down to either end of the rail, kneel or stand as you are able. I will simply ask you if this is for you or for someone else, and I will pray an ancient prayer of the church over you. Most importantly, this is not our table. This is God's table. If you are here, you are welcomed, invited. 
you are encouraged to come. The table is now prepared. Will you come at the direction of the ushers?
God, we have been fed at this table. We have found you in the wilderness. Send us out now. Help us nourish the world with your love and grace as we find transformation, justice, and hope. Amen. Will you please stand as we continue singing our final song together? hearts receive the gift of the benediction receive peace the grace of Jesus Christ the love of God the communion of the Holy Spirit bring it out with you into the world amen Amen.